Welcome to the Austin Action Fest Podcast. We focus on filmmaking from idea to distribution and everything in between. We focus on you getting your project in the can and for the world to see. Thank you for listening to the Austin Action Fest Podcast. Now let's get cracking. We're glad that you are here with us. After some technical delays, we're on with the famed Roman of Film Reframed. My friend, thank you for your patience. Thank you for being with us. How have you been? Yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me here. I'm glad we worked through the tech issues. <laughs> cool. So for our viewers at home who do not know how you are so amazing, tell them why you are great and why they should be checking for you. Hey, absolutely. So my name's Roman. I'm the uh, founder, co-creator, and lead instructor at uh, Film Reframed. And at Film Reframed, we teach composition and visual storytelling. So I use my background as a professional storyboard artist and director here in Los Angeles to teach filmmakers around the world how to tell their stories more effectively through imagery. Yes, which is amazing. And all these things apply to action, especially because there are so many things we do where there are no words to help tell that story. And literally all you have is the visuals. That is why we brought Roman here. So Roman, to kick this off a little light, favorite action movie of 2021 thus far, let's say last 12 months, and why? Favorite action movie of the last 12 months. Ooh, man, you're putting me on the spot. That's a tough question. Um, let's see. You know, I will say that there was a scene that just one scene, maybe not the movie, but the scene in uh, the movie Malignant, where they have a stunt performer who fights people backwards. So she's literally standing backwards, and she does all the choreography fighting behind her. And I just thought, man, that's a that's a skill. So... Okay, so not in reverse, like, uh, oh my goodness, am I really going to draw a blank on, am I seriously drawing a blank on this movie like I haven't seen it 15 times? <sighs> the movie they fight in reverse is all about time, director Memento, goodness gracious, at, this is shameful. Oh, Tenet? Tenet, yes, yes. So not like that, this is actually, they're fighting facing reverse. Yeah, because of the horror effect makeup that they place on the character, the character is actually, like, the actor is standing backwards and the makeup of the head of the character is on the back. So she fights, does everything in reverse. It's very impressive. Wow. Okay, so this is going on the list. Is that is that the main reason? Or is there something in the composition that you liked? Or is it just the, the fact that that was so difficult? Uh, it's a combination of both, but when I think of... When I think of modern action movies, what I look for is something that pushes the genre, pushes the, um, the the collective work of all of the filmmakers as a whole forward. And so when I see something I haven't seen before and it's particularly effective, I take note of that because it seems like it's advancing the genre as a whole. Got it. So I'm going to let you kind of just get into it and kind of give your 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 opinions, your stances on some different things, kind of like a mini, mini, mini class. And then I'm going to dive in with questions, but I want to let you just kind of talk about some things that you've seen, some things you think you'd like to see, um, some stuff like that. And then I'll start jumping in with questions. I want to, but I want people to get at least a good 10 minutes of you just instructing and giving your pearliest pearls of wisdom, Roman. Does that work for you? Yeah, absolutely. Is that something where you'd like me to share my screen and present the class, or would you like me to just speak here over the webcam? Yeah, if you if sharing the screen works, go for it. If it if it does anything weird, just we're not gonna we're not gonna fuss with it. We're just gonna roll. Okay, I'm gonna hit share. Here we go. Sharing my screen. Just like I teach the classes. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, looks amazing. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll just, as you said, we're going to do a little 10 minute excerpt from one of the courses that we teach at Film Reframed, and that is composition for action. So when we talk about storytelling, you may ask, why do we focus so much on composition? Composition is the arrangement of elements and objects within a frame. So when you think about the medium of film, uh, everything is presented to you in a two-dimensional way on a screen, but we have many different factors and things that we need to arrange, such as the characters and the background elements, props, 
and in doing that, we can tell a very sophisticated story without using any words at all. So when we discuss visual storytelling for action movies, we want to take note of how we can visually identify characters and separate them from each other without having to rely on dialogue. Um, action movies are notable for having a firm grasp on how to communicate with audiences uh, just through costume design, color, and um, sorry, I'm hearing an echo on this side here. Turn this down a minute. Okay. So to get rid of the echo and hearing myself in my own ear, let's take a look at this scene from the movie The Five Deadly Venoms. Now, Kung Fu enthusiasts, uh, Quentin Tarantino fans alike should have a already a great knowledge of this movie. Uh, if not, I highly recommend you go check it out. Um, but what is great about this film is that they do an excellent job communicating visually with their audience as to which characters uh, we should be focusing on at any given point in time and to help us visually distinguish from five very similar characters. So at the beginning of the film, as you can see in the top left here, they introduce five different characters, each with a particular animal associated with them and a particular style of Kung Fu uh, that matches that animal. So you can see that all of the characters are masked to hide their identities from the audience. So we're going to need some other visual signifiers to help key the audience into when we're seeing each particular fighter on screen. Now through composition and the use of color, the filmmakers have done a great job of showing showcasing how each of these actors and characters relates to the animal they're associated with and the colors help distinguish for the audience who they're paying attention to at any point in time. So in this introductory sequence of these characters, we see that uh, the centipede here is portrayed with a red light in the background. Uh, we have the snake, which is represented by a blue light in the background. We have the scorpion who is represented with a purple light and this goes on for the lizard with the yellow and the toad with the green. Now this is important in setting up the characters at the beginning of the film because as we watch the remainder of the film, we are keyed into when we were seeing each of these fighters based on these colors. So there's a repeated motif of each of these colors being used for each of these fighters. And in this introductory sequence, each composition helps showcase their particular skill set, which aligns with the animal character that they are portraying. So for instance, uh, here in the composition in the bottom right with the frog, we can see our character laying on a bed of nails and we understand that one of his strengths is his resistance ability. Here we have a composition with the scorpion where high jump kicks are their specialty and we see that they are raised higher in the composition. So we have through the visual storytelling of the introduction of each of these characters, a shot which most displays their ability and correlates them to the animal that they're related to. So all of this is to say, uh, this is one of the foundational films in the evolution of Kung Fu cinema. And when we have movies like this at the origin point of some of these genres or some of these touch points that people are still referencing today, you can see that this work carries through in what they do. So when you're making your own action movies, you're making your own films where you have many characters that you need to distinguish from each other and give very strong identities, consider using a strong color or a signifier such as an animal to help link your audience's memory to each of those characters and you'll create a much more iconic and visually striking type of character. So rather than having all of your characters dressed similarly or shooting a film that relies primarily on one or two neutral colors to uh, unify the scene, you can implement a particular sort of labeling, if you will, of each of the characters that can give them a very distinct personality and make them stand out in your audience's memory. Now, as a, another brief uh, example of some things that uh, action cinema does very well, um, we have symbolism that is communicated in the environment of the compositions of these films as well. So here we have a shot from the Yimou Sang film uh, Shadow, and we see that 
this movie is uh, communicating a conflict between two different factions, each represented by either the white or the black of the yin yang symbol. But you can see that by staging a fighting arena that is built in a circle that has the yin and yang displayed on the floor of that platform, we can create a composition that emphasizes the movement of each of the actors. So you can see that we have many of these radial lines rotating around the characters based in the set design. And this gives the visual illusion, even in a still frame here, you can almost feel the motion of this character's swing of his long weapon here. And so by incorporating visual elements in the background that emulate movement patterns, we as filmmakers can make fight scenes even more dynamic and give them a sense of flow. So this particular scene, when you watch it, has a tremendous sense of sweeping visual imagery. Uh, and that is thanks in large part to these repeated lines, which create what we call directional force. So if you wanna increase the visual impact of a shot where you have two characters or more fighting each other, consider implementing items into the background of your film to emphasize that. Wow. Additionally, we're all built on a foundation of uh, certain universal symbols, things that mean something similar across cultures. And if we leverage them visually, we can enhance the storytelling for our audiences in our film. So if we look at this example from the movie Kung Fu Hustle, we see a scene where the Axe Gang is walking into uh, the tenement neighborhood here, and they are about to um, cause some havoc. But to visually emphasize this, the filmmakers added in a digital cloudscape so that when our, you know, what we would call our antagonists move into the town, the clouds move with our antagonists and cast a shadow on the ground. Now, visually, this creates a very clear delineation between who our good guys are and who our bad guys are within the scene. You can see that our character that is what we would call a protagonist or a good guy is dressed in white, and we see that they're on the side of the street that is still bathed in sunlight, so things are feeling light and bright. Whereas on the other side of the screen, because we have this cloud cover moving in, we cast a dark shadow over many dark characters. And that gives us the visual instruction to understand without any doubts that these are antagonists and the other characters are protagonists. This is also interesting because at this point in the film, the character on the left has not necessarily been introduced as somebody that we know we are going to be on their side. In fact, they've been at times annoying or frustrating for our lead characters. So to see this composition, this is a moment where we discover or embrace the fact that the character on the left here is actually going to become a notable protagonist in our film. And later she supports our hero in many different ways throughout the movie. So all of this foreshadowed or telegraphed by this composition and the implementation of a dark side and a light side. So we can see that leveraging color and different set pieces can help communicate to our audience in a much stronger way and set us up with a clear understanding of the film. Even if you haven't seen this movie, just looking at this one particular screenshot can communicate a lot of that visual information. So, so awesome. that's a quick sample there for you. Let me go ahead and jump back into the event here. Yeah, no, man, that was that was awesome, man. I love that. Uh, one, I watched the Five Deadly Venoms, and I felt what you said, but I didn't. When I was watching, I was so young, I probably wasn't paying close enough attention. But I got, I got the feeling of what you were saying, and uh, I do remember watching Kung Fu Hustle, and I do remember watching her be irritating. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's it's funny that you like. Again, there's so many elements that you, when you watch a film, these films like this, you don't, you're not, you're not processing what's happening, um, like consciously. You feel it and you kind of get it afterwards, but you're not thinking, "Oh man, the clouds are coming in." Those are the bad guys. You just know that that's what that's supposed to signify, and you just know that she's on the she's on the good side. 
you feel that just from watching the frame. So that is um that is that is really really amazing, man. So thank you so much for kind of diving into some of the some of the concepts. So you teach, I mean, so that was a lot in just that couple those couple of things there. I had a question about the Project Shadow because I don't think I've seen that one, right? With the with the yin and the yang symbol on the ground, was the choreography big sweeping strikes? It looks like there was like a guan dao, and I'm not sure what the other gentleman had, but it looks like there was some big weapons in there. With it, was the choreography big and looping and sweeping kung fu as well? Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's what I'm hoping to communicate by showing that set pieces that you have movements that interact with the background and so they really emphasize each other and that makes each big swing of those broad uh you know fighting instruments even more epic exaggerated and when you combine that with the sound design man those are things you just feel it in the theater it feels very um hefty and and like uh, impactful so yeah and what's interesting is that quite frequently um you know we get called in to do choreography for people and a lot of times I'm asking, you know, who's the character? Let me see, you know, the script or whatever. And I can put the, I have fight sequences already written in a book, right? I got that stuff already set, set aside. Um, but until I know the story and the characters and the environment and whatever, there's certain extra things that I can't do, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not even the things that like the average person may necessarily catch, but like someone who's paying attention, like analyzing the frame the way you just did, those people would catch what I'm doing, but the, I mean, the, the person who's even hiring me to do a choreography may not even understand how much attention to detail is going in. Um, a lot of times, for instance, a lot of times when people have seen something like uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which is, I think, one of the best movies made that happens to be action oriented, right? Um, it's beautiful, right? Now you have Michelle Yeoh, you have Zhang Ji, you have... Um, Chai, in fact, these people are really good at what they do. So you have these longer takes. You could do the wider takes. Everything's floating, right? And it's beautifully executed. And people want to mimic that sometimes with the shots. And, I'm, and I have to say, like, well, yeah, but you don't. This is a boxing movie. The whole fight is chest up. Like, you're not doing it. There's no low, you're not doing a low mana stance. You're not doing anything where you're even coming close to the bottom of the ground. So it's just wasted. It's a wasted section of frame, and there's not enough movement with the, with the lower half to make it really impactful. And so it's really interesting when people, like, as from a, from a directorial standpoint, you have people who want to mimic something, and, like, you can't just mimic... You can mimic that one thing, but it won't have the same level of impact as the thing you're mimicking if you don't take into account all the different levels and layers. Does that make sense? Yeah, basically what I'm hearing and I think really gets at the, you know, the core concept of why we instruct at Film Reframe is for filmmakers, you need to understand what you're trying to communicate to your audience. And if you are rooted in that knowledge for yourself, and you and your team have discovered what you want to communicate, say, in the instance of your example, if you have a boxing scene, if your filmmakers understand what is important and interesting about boxing, what it says about their characters that they're in that particular fight in that particular moment, if they're basing their decisions based on their knowledge of their own story, then they're not mimicking something they've seen in another movie. They're actually creating something that supports their particular movie. And you're right, exactly. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is beautiful, but it's because it supports those characters' journeys, it supports that particular environment and location, it supports those fighting styles. And so if you're trying to translate one to the other, you know, you can always gain inspiration from these movies, but you really need to check in with yourself and have an understanding of what you want to share about your characters. Exactly. And I know, I think we talked about this before, but, you know, a lot for a while, everybody wanted to do, you know, the born identity, right? And I'm like, that's... That's cool. But a lot of people were trying to do the born identity because they didn't know how to fight. And so the trick was we're going to do shaky and realistic, you know, uh, the, the, the chaos of battle with the camera maneuvers. And I'm like, well, that's not pretty. And at the same time, you know, Matt Damon and people like Joey Anza in those fights, they could fight. Like, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a choice that was done in order to get around like a lack of a skill set it was a it was an intentional choice and 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 i think that a lot of people don't they don't understand things like that and so we have to 
I think it's good for people to consider, like you're saying, exactly why you're making a choice. Now, I understand, like, a lot of us will be shooting something, and maybe it's getting dark outside or whatever. And we're just moving. We're just trying to get it done. But when you have the time, you know, beforehand to pre-plan, to try to be as thoughtful about those frames as you are about the words. And I think a lot of people, when they look at action, they feel like it's a throwaway. And for people like us who go to, I go watch action movies, like, it's not a throwaway. That fight scene should be conveying some information. I should feel something. Something should happen because of that fight scene. Do you kind of agree with that? Oh, absolutely. You know, the example we used from the movie Shadow uh, with Yi Mao saying, he's quoted as saying that, uh, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, but that uh, action should be the result of an inevitable conflict. So it should be whenever you have fighting it should be that's there's no other choice there has to be a fight so your plot elements are not designed to make excuses for fights but rather you have characters who have their own motivations in their lives they have their own goals and as a result of them pursuing those goals they may meet at an intersection where neither can continue to pursue their goal until they you know excise that conflict physically and so that's what's great about action scenes in movies and that's why it can really be, you know, uh, those can be the most impactful moments for character to see how they handle a fight. I mean, I know for me, at least, and for many audience members, when you see a character who's been beaten down over the course of a fight and they continue to get back up and keep pushing, you can feel that more resonantly in your spirit than you can any line of dialogue saying they're determined saying they're dedicated <laughs> you know just watching them get back up after you saw them get punched in the throat it's pretty good you know <laughs> you can feel it no you're, you're totally you're totally correct and um i forget I, I think it was the i cannot remember it was a book by john crane it was one of the first books one of the only books i was able to find when i first started book on fight choreography and I think I forget what the wording of his book is. It's like the art of nonverbal something, something. But it was a great book on fight choreography. And it made me think about these fights differently. Instead of like, ooh, what's a flashy way I can put a gainer in this movie? Um, thinking about the character. And then once I, you know, think through the character, like, yeah, would a soccer mom do a, a B twist into a 540 and kick someone in the head, even if she's seen on television? No, she wouldn't. No, she absolutely wouldn't. Would a ninja do that? Also, the answer tru truly is no, um, unless they ne needed to, because or unless they're trying to impress someone. And so see, there's some of the things that we get to think through in composing the action. And it's one of those things, I think one of the, the biggest movies I saw that really adjusted my view of how action could be done beautifully was also The Matrix. And what was weird about watching The Matrix when I was older after doing martial arts a little more was I realized how not fast that movie is. It was longer takes and it was very, very clean and, and really well done and executed technique. But it was not, um, it wasn't quick. Like I felt like it was quick, but the, it's not quick. And so, uh, it, I'm sure you've seen The Matrix. Did you have any particular takeaways from when you watched that movie? Yeah, you know what? Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen with you again, and I can show you some <laughs> moments from The Matrix. Let's go for it. That, that was not planned, by the way. That was that was organic. <laughs> yeah, let's let's get into it. So, uh, one of the examples we teach in our uh, composition for action class is a scene from the matrix and I'll just take a moment to run you through something that I thought is particularly uh, useful here is this idea of communicating and telegraphing the types of movements the characters are going to do based on uh, what we'll call handing off the ball from one character to another through eyeline. So I'm going to explain that in more detail if that didn't make a lot of sense up front. But one of the things that I like about the Matrix in this particular scene, sort of the uh, climactic action scene here where they're uh, moving through the bank lobby, um, is that you have two characters working together uh, in tandem. You have uh, Neo and Trinity, and they're both working together as a team throughout the film. So uh, I'll go here to an example of, let's see, maybe it's the beginning of the film here. There you go. So you have 
our two lead characters walking in and we see them walk into the room together. They're unified here. They're both pursuing the same goal. But as they walk into the frame, we see a variety of these, you know, foot soldiers here run into the room, point guns at them. And at that point, they look at each other and decide that they need to split in two different directions in order to tackle this group of uh, aggressors here. So in this composition where we see the two of them look at each other and they both run in different directions, we now have a scene that needs to be orchestrated very carefully. We need to be able to understand the geography of all of the characters throughout the fight scene, understand where they are in the room, how many of the opposing uh, fighters that they've taken out. We need to somehow visually keep track of all this information. And when you refer to it as being a very clean movie uh, in the way that it's executed, uh, I would you know, point to this as an example of how it's doing that very effectively. So the two characters run off in either side of the screen, and we cut to a shot where Trinity is running from camera right to camera left, and we see a long aisle here in this shot with one of the antagonists here with a gun. And by showing us the length of this aisle, we're showing us the audience, the depth of the room. We're showing them the geography of the space that they're going to be in, as well as the fact that we're showing her going towards camera left. So we know that anything that's going to happen on the left side of the room, that's going to be Trinity and her responsibility. And then we and see so, a shot of Neo running to the right side of the room. Now that we've established the geography and the depth of the room, we can cut to a closer shot of Neo and see him running to the right. So we as an audience can assume that the room extends out in both directions equally. And so now we understand where Neo is and where Trinity is. So that is really, we cut that's really this interesting shot what you're saying there. Facing in this direction on the side of the room, we know that these particular soldiers are firing at Neo because we're cross cut with them. So you see these characters here, it makes sense that they're on this side of the room. And as Neo continues to run over to the corner here, we see him pass to the other side of the pillar. And now we have a setup where he will be on uh, this side of the camera, on camera right. And that will now align with his enemy, which is shooting from camera left. Um, so in terms of the way that the rest of the scene functions and what I wanted to point out here, the characters pass off action back and forth to each other by taking moments to glance at each other or to glance towards that side of the camera or room. So we see a shot here on the top left where Neo's being uh, attacked and he's behind a pillar and he takes a moment within the edit to turn his head and look in this direction. And by doing that, we can follow his eye line out towards the camera and now because he took that moment to look this way, it's almost like we have a reason or a cause to cut to what he might be seeing. And that's Trinity on the other side of the room running against the wall. So just a brief moment of directing your viewer's eye by having your character turn and look towards something can cleanly pass off the location of the camera to your audience. And so again, as you mentioned, you know, all of this stuff is not anything you're conscious of while you're watching the movie, but you would be very conscious of it if they weren't doing this because you would feel very disorganized, disoriented. There's a lot of action and chaos going on, but because we're able to see that handoff here, uh, everything logistically makes a lot of sense to us. And there's never a question of where they are in this room, even though they have quite a bit of action to cover. So no, that was awesome. Uh, as you said, there, completely unplanned handoff. Very funny uh, <laughs> that we had some examples from that in there. But uh, thanks for no, bringing that up. That was beautifully executed. And um, one of the interesting things I noticed, and this is just from a, again, a lot of us, a lot of the people who attend this festival, a lot of people who uh, come to these markets, a lot of people who do action, we we double dip, right? So like I on my projects, I'm typically also second unit director, which means I have to choose what lenses, I have to choose all that stuff as well. Like typically, I like to do that, I don't have to, I, I enjoy that part too. So it's like for instance, that shot where you have the pillar, right? If, if I'm being unintentional 
And let's just say I have whatever lens on my camera, I would shoot it with whatever lens I had on my camera. But if I'm being intentional, I might want to break the zoom lens out, you know, and zoom out to accentuate the distance of that room. If I'm trying to show you how heroic this task is, I might zoom out, you know, and stretch the room out in one shot. And then once I've done that, I can move into the next shot. If I want to compress the room for a different purpose, that's cool. But like, those are things that like the DP is often making decisions like that as well. But like, because I'm often my own DP, I have to think through these things as well. And it's very easy when we're rocking and rolling with some action to, to not want to slow down and consider what lenses you're shooting with and change it. I, I trust me. There have been many things I've done with an 18 to 35 and a 50. And that is all we had, and we just made it work. But again, when you have time and when you're trying to do something on that caliber, that level, like, you know, Wachowskis or, you know, something like that, you have to spend that kind of time. It doesn't feel like it might matter that much, but it really does matter that much. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting that you make the designation there um, about focal length of lenses. It's really you know, you can, you can simplify the, you know, the crux behind what you're saying as, you know, with each shot, try to understand what you want to say to your audience with that shot. And so it's as simple as, um, you know, if you want to, to just do it very foundationally, when you're picking a shot for your fight scene, maybe the impetus behind your shot is we really want to see that he got punched in the face hard. So what's our shot that's going to show that? Or, if you're trying to set up the room, for instance, and you need to see how many people Neo and Trinity are up against, that's the impetus for your shot. And then you say, okay, how can we compose the shot to emphasize how many people there are? And so then that leads to those decisions that are more on the technical side, right? So if you're saying, how, how can I show that there's a lot of people in this room? Maybe you choose to shoot on a wider lens so you can really show everybody in the room. Or maybe you pick a fisheye lens and warp it so it looks like there's even more people all around them, surrounding them. You know, you just have to pick what's the reason for this shot. And then once you've picked the, once you've identified for yourself, why am I using a shot here? Then you can make everything else support that. And it's, uh, helps kind of guide you through, uh, the chaos of a fight scene. Absolutely. That is fantastic. So I see you have a, a bunch of things prepared. So is there anything you specifically wanted to hit on that I may not, I may not be ready with a handoff. Is there anything you specifically want to touch on that we can chat about? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to take a moment here. I'll jump back into the screen share. This is something that I thought would be relevant, not only to um, fight choreographers, but also in action movies, we often have uh, chase scenes with characters. And so I just wanted to take a moment to point out, uh, how the chase scene from <laughs> Casino Royale creates yeah. a, uh, a very compelling moment for our audience and we feel like we're part of the chase. And I want to show this why. This is one of my favorite chase scenes ever. To be just so you know that this is the movie that made me want to do parkour was this movie. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, there is some incredible parkour in this film. So I just wanted to take a moment to show you here, and I'm going to turn down my speaker a little bit so I don't hear my own uh, voice. So if you interject with something, I may not be able to hear you there, Ben. But uh, Copy that. So with this particular shot, what I think is great is that you are constantly receiving context with each new shot. So it's not just about watching the characters run fast or showing the, their facial expressions that they're tired. Uh, we really are considering visually how to show the audience how they're progressing through the scene and the geography of the scene so that they can feel like they're part of the chase. If we know where each character is at all times, we have a pretty good understanding of how close or far away they are from each other, which means we understand how close or anticipating we should be that our main character will actually catch the antagonist. So that makes us feel like there's a lot more imperative uh, to the scene and it really draws us in. And I will show you the way that they do that is by always providing you with uh, context identifiers uh, in the location. So here in this shot we have in the distance, so you can see him here, we have James Bond climbing over the fence and we can see our antagonist running away in the foreground. So here in this shot, we can see the depth of the environment, just like we could see the depth with the pillars in the shot from the matrix. 
We can see how far away they are from each other, so we know that our bad guy is essentially getting away. But here in this shot, we cut to that character jumping over this fence, flipping over it, and running off into the distance here. So when we cut back and we see our main character, James Bond, jump over this fence, when we, we cut back to it, we recognize that fence as the fence that's back here. So you can see it in this top shot here. We already gave the audience context for where this shot's going to be. So when we cut back to it, we know exactly where he is in the pursuit. So we see him drop in here. Our antagonist runs away. And as he runs, he runs across a vast landscape here where we can see a wide shot of the entire building that they're going to be doing the chase scene uh, on. And this shot happens long before our characters are involved with any of this background stuff here. But I just wanted to point out and show you that in this wide shot, you can see all of the items that the characters are going to interact with later in the scene. So they make a <laughs> conscious effort to show you that there's this sort of uh, ladder device here, and they show you the building that's in construction, so you can see all of the weird cross beams and the crane. So we're seeing all of this information up front and establishing that it's going to be here so that as the chase continues and our characters uh, move into those environments, we actually feel like we're following along and we feel like that was uh, supposed to be part of it here. So I'm going to just zoom back in a little bit and take you to the next section here. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll jump by that here, but... Um, when we have our characters, so you see they go through a variety of scenes to get through this chase. And then as we get towards the, uh, you know, probably a minute later in the scene, that, that payoff, that setup that we had, seeing these background elements, we now get the payoff of seeing our antagonist run up some items and onto the building in construction. So we recognize this building from 12, 14 shots earlier. And that makes this feel like it's an inevitable conclusion. Like, again, like we said, like they had nowhere else to go. They had no choice. Our antagonist had no choice but to go up this building that's in construction to try to get away. And so that leads to a very compelling action scene where you have James Bond, of course, running up this uh, ladder onto the building. And you can see that in both of these shots here, we have a really strong emphasis through the use of the lens of the length and the distance that he has to travel. We make this ladder look like it's just infinitely long. I mean, look how far that looks. It looks so dangerous. It looks so difficult. And uh, by choosing shot angles that emphasize uh, the amount of context around these items, we feel the way the character feels. We feel like this is scary because we can see how far he would fall if he fell off. Whereas if we were just focusing on a close-up of him the whole time, if we had just cut into this close-up here, we wouldn't at all get the sense of danger that he was going through. We wouldn't get that exaggerated sense of the chase. And uh, it would feel very contained. The scene would feel very uh, stale and confusing. But because we have all these nice context shots which show us all of the elements that our characters are going to interact with, we really feel like we're part of that scene. And so when he makes this jump, we feel that jump and we know how long he could fall because we have this composition here prior. So the scene continues on in that manner, but it's a great example because you can just watch every scene as a setup and a payoff of showcasing how dangerous this stunt is and uh, how difficult the chase must be for our main character all through the visuals. That is amazing. No, no, that is that is absolutely amazing. One, that is one of my favorite chase scenes in a movie ever. Uh, I'm going to, man, I might get like hate mail for this. I've never been what you would call a James Bond fan, right? I mean, the movies well enough. I just, I, I just, you are, I didn't know that. I mean, that's cool. I'm just saying. Until Daniel Craig, I was not a big James Bond fan. After Daniel Craig, I was like, this, this is a rough dude. I like it. Like he's, you know, boxing. It's not just karate chops that are judo chops that are just knocking people unconscious. Like, this guy's he's getting in there. All respect to Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan was okay as well. But I'm just saying, Daniel Craig, when I saw this, I was like, this is a different kind of movie. I'm I'm here for all of this. Uh, 
But that chase scene was one of the most fun. I mean, it's the reason I wanted to learn the Kong. The Kong is when you, for who don't, those who don't know, when you dive forward, you commit with a, like a, a full dive horizontal, your hands touch, you swing your legs through, and your feet don't actually touch whatever you're going over. This is what made me want to learn those sorts of moves. So I absolutely love that, Jason. You're picking my, ba- you're picking my favorite scenes out right now. So um, I'll have to just see what else you have queued up just because you seem to be picking the things – I really enjoy, uh, side note, the side flip that Trinity does in that, um, off that wall. Like I remember watching so much stuff from the matrix, like happen in other genres. It was ridiculous. So I played a game. This is the nerd side coming out Jedi outcast. So it was a very old, I think it was a PC game for with lightsabers and Jedi. It was amazing. But of course you could flip off walls, you could do side flips and everything they did reminded me of the matrix because the matrix had done such a fantastic job of putting in those little, you know, those little elements that you mean, you weren't really seeing being well executed in American movies at that time. So fantastic stuff. Okay. So what else am I skipping here? What else should we be asking you? Because you got, I mean, I could ask you random questions and I'm sure you could give us some good stuff. Um, you know, I'm a throw. Okay. You know, we're going off book here. So have you seen the new, did you see the new black widow, uh, project that came out? I have not seen it yet, man. Was that a conscious decision or was this, you just didn't have time? No, we were uh, traveling during the time that it came out, so I missed that window, and I thought I want to see it in the theater, and then it just kept getting delayed and delayed, and we were out of town, so missed it. Got it. Okay, I was going to ask you a question about that, but since you haven't seen it, when we do a, we do a follow-up, I want your opinion of the last fight scene, the last action sequence. I want to know what you felt about it. But we'll come back to that once you've had a chance to watch that. But that sounds good. Yeah, because I was. Uh, I'm. Oh, we have a we have a question from the audience, Danielle. I repeat. I want to know if Roman went into the Jedi Temple and killed Anakin. Because that's what I understood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Usually a really good collab. Should be a collaboration. Got it. Um, but I'm just really curious about. Okay. So Danielle's asking in regards to composition, do you typically find that it is the director is leading the uh, DP or cinematographer, or vice versa, or is it more of a collaboration? Should she says should be a collaboration. What do you find is most common, and do you have an opinion on how it should be done? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, your creative team is all there to support the overall vision of the film. So in an ideal scenario, the director is the person who has the strongest understanding of the vision of the film, and they can help communicate the key information that they need to to their crew members so that the crew can take that vision and amplify it, bring it to a higher quality. So the director and DP relationship, as far as I've experienced it, is very integrated. Those uh, two directors of their own, uh, you know, scope talk in great detail with each other. And it, to me, the films that have been executed the most successfully that I've been a part of are the ones where the director and DP spend a lot of time in pre-production, talking through all of the uh, reasons behind their decisions and creating a scope of what we'll call rules for how they decide to execute their film in order to maintain a consistent vision throughout. So as you know, when you're shooting a scene, especially with today's technology, you have what I would call an infinite amount of choices as to how you could shoot the scene. So it's up to the director and the DP to narrow down what would be an infinite palette of all different types of things that you can do and try to narrow it down to something consistent that's going to tell the story in a specific style. And they are the ones who determine that style. So ideally, you're working very closely together throughout the process. But I'd say that the uh, the vision for uh, the motivation of compositions should start with the director and become amplified by the DP. So I, I think that that is um, what I find to be most successful. However, I think that I should make the note that there's something to be said for directors who don't have a very strong sense of visual storytelling. I think that uh, 
in all cases, you should look to be a good listener. You know, as a director, you brought in a team to help you work through the elements of your project that you can't do yourself or that you are not as confident in. And there are professionals and people that have spent their entire life dedicated to that one thing that they do. So for instance, uh, you know, you bring on a costume designer to your film because you don't know how to design a costume. You don't know how to sew. And similarly, if you're a director and you don't have a strong sense of visual storytelling, that's an opportunity for you to listen to your director of photography and hear what they've picked up on the numerous projects that they've worked on and what they think they can bring to the table. So I really think that it involves a lot of uh, listening as well as communicating to them what you're looking for. Awesome. You had a question? I'll repeat it. Yeah. Does he do voice acting? Because I've enjoyed just listening to him. Oh my gosh. Okay. So the question from the crowd was, do you do voice acting because they love your voice? Uh, that's so funny. I do actually. Yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I'm a represented commercial voiceover artist. Yes. <laughs> I did not. I totally did not know that. That is hilarious. Um, chill. That'd be a lot. Get you and chill on the same thing with the bass, man. It'd be, it's all about that bass. Um, I think, I'm sorry. I think that song's about something else. I'm sorry. Uh, any other questions from the crowd right now while we're in question? We're just going into question mode. It's free form now. Do you have any questions? Nothing off the top of his head. It's all good. We can continue. We can continue rolling for a little bit. Um, so as far as any recent movies, the most recent movies you've watched, is there anything that you've seen that has a really, really good and strong composition that kind of stood out to you besides, was it Malignant, right? Yeah. Besides that, is there anything else that's been out that, uh, like the most commercial thing you've seen that had impressive composition? It doesn't have to necessarily be action. Yeah, you know, I would reference the, the new, the um, sequel to Candyman. I thought had some very, very intentional visual design behind its storytelling. And uh, that's a movie that deeply understands how to communicate to an audience's subconscious. So I watched that and I felt very inspired and heartened for, um, you know, sort of the, the horror genre, knowing that there was somebody paying that much attention to what they were doing. So I thought that was very impressive. Okay, so that's it. I'm gonna have to go watch it. I've heard, I've been getting mixed reviews right so and i'm not i'm not huge i don't watch everything that comes out horror related but i will watch a lot of things so if you're saying it's good and i got to go learn some composition stuff from it i will i will put it on the list yeah you exactly never? and that's you know i want to clarify when it comes to visual storytelling you know it's one component of what makes a successful and impactful film so it's not the only thing that a film stands up on but it is something that is very uh, important to communicating your story. So for instance, like in the case of Malignant that we referenced earlier, I would say as a piece of storytelling, it was challenging to watch and didn't necessarily hit that mark. But in terms of the action sequence that they went through, that particular performance and moment was very impressive. Similarly in Candyman, it may not hit all the marks that horror fans are looking for in terms of being afraid, or it may not hit the social commentary marks that people are looking for if they're looking for a certain type of film out of it. But in terms of what it does to tell its story visually, you could basically watch it with the sound off and still get the whole movie, which is I think a mark of impressive visual storytelling. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's definitely one of the ones I, I'll, I'll take a look at. Um, I was something I was getting. Oh, I know it was. What I wanted to ask you is just for in general for for people that are kind of really just starting to get started. Um, if if you okay, this is, I like to I want to word this delicately. As filmmakers, we don't we can be very critical of other people's works. So if you don't want to cite any specific references to the or examples of what the question i'm getting ready to ask you it's okay and you can you can gracefully bow out but are, what are some things that you consistently see when dealing with new filmmakers new students or whatever or even in hollywood films that are kind of like consistent issues that could be fixed like three things that people should be looking for and if you can cite some examples you feel comfortable doing that uh, we'd love to hear them so we can go review 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things I think that is, um, you know, lacking in most most films that reach the theaters these days is uh, exactly what we teach here. It's an emphasis on composition and storytelling. So there's been a push for what I would call a naturalism in film or a realism, a sense of, you know, everything's got to feel real so that the audience will, you know, buy into it. And it doesn't seem, you know, people are afraid to stylize things because they don't want their audience to feel like it's fake, right? But I think what filmmakers that take that approach are maybe underestimating is how much specific thought you still have to put into the composition and the arrangement of people, how much staging does need to take place because ultimately we're not making documentaries here, we're telling a story. And so you need to know which elements to punch and which elements to let sit back. And so, you know, it's like playing music, right? And uh, uh, you, I think that I see a lot of uh, filmmakers who are, you know, entering this you know modern slate of cinema being too restrained when it comes to their visual storytelling they just cover it in basic coverage medium shot wide shot they try to stay out of the way so that it feels <laughs> real but ultimately what you end up with is a movie that doesn't compel your audience or drive your audience forward with the characters and i think many filmmakers underestimate how much these visual cues actually bring to the emotional experience for your audience. So I think that's why people often feel like, you know, and I may be uh, speaking broadly here, but I think when people consider like, what does it mean to be a movie? Like when you think of a real movie, what do you think of? A lot of people think Steven Spielberg, they think like Jurassic Park or Jaws. And, you know, I think that those movies have such a strong cinematic approach and are very visual in their storytelling so I think people feel like they're missing some of that because even I'd say even like the modern Marvel movies uh, are still not approaching the stylization and of visual storytelling that Spielberg was doing in those movie movies, right? So everything is feeling, I think, a bit understated because people want to play it safe and not seem overly stylized. And I, I think that's a mistake personally. So uh, I'd like, yeah. you know, to tell uh, if you're a, a new filmmaker, aspiring filmmaker, you're working on your first project, I'd say don't be afraid to sit down and really think through what you want to share, what you want to say, and trust that if you are making uh, specific intentional decisions to communicate those ideas, that people are going to pick up on that and they're going to feel that. And if you can get them to feel something, that's that's your goal, not to be natural. You know, oh, that is that is a strong one. You know, I it's interesting that you say that. I've never looked at those as two points of contention, but I can see how they can be something so fantastic compared to you know, but still try to. I can see how someone will be drawn, uh, torn between those two, uh, quote unquote opposites in the area of film. That is really, really good. So on that on that note, actually, one of the things I've been seeing, I've been watching, I watched everything that's action on every one of the, the platforms, right? That just happens. Um, I've been watching a lot of anime recently. Weirdly enough, I'm not a huge, I don't know if you know what One Piece is, but I'm not a huge One Piece fan, but I've been listening to the uh, people's analysis of the characters and and watching so much of it and it's been really interesting but, but while i'm watching these analysis of the characters i'm watching these shots from the show because i haven't it's a, it's a very very long show but i've been watching these shots from the show and i'm going man that would be really really cool to get it in in a live action i haven't seen a lot of those things transition from anime or video game to live action all that well i think the witcher did a pretty good, a pretty good job, but in general, video games to, to movies are getting better. But animated to, to movies is still seems to be a bit rough because anime is incredibly stylized, and they don't care, which, which I, I really enjoy. Do you do you have any thoughts on you know the Japanese animation style and the manga and all that stuff, and how those compositions? are being adapted to American films? Because like I know Cowboy Bebop is coming out now. I don't know if you have any knowledge of that. 
Yeah, exactly. No, I think that, uh, so my background is I'm a storyboard illustrator and I, you know, approach directing from that perspective. So I have a, a deep love for uh, comic book illustrators, people who tell stories through, you know, panel by panel. It's essentially a film on paper, but the, the real, you know, uh, thing that I think you're getting at with seeing a lot of these anime, uh, you know, stories being translated into live action movies is um, people take notice of the fact that they can be compelled by the story just through the imagery and that anime stuff is very strong at that. So you can tell so much about a character by the way that they jump or, <laughs> you know, by the way that they turn their head. Right. And people feel yep. that when they're looking through the material. So I think that when they make adaptations and they base it off of the source material, what they're doing is creating a stronger film. The more they lean into the conventions that work well within the, the comic book or the manga. And, uh, you know, I think of the example of, uh, you know, this is not anime, but when you think of a direct from a, from a graphic novel of some kind to a, uh, you know, finished film product. You think of the strength of the visuals in the movie Sin City that came out. Was oh, based on yeah. the and they leaned into the style of the graphic novel so hard that that became the style of the movie. And that movie <laughs> is memorable in the sense that nothing looks like that. And people tried to do it afterwards, <laughs> but nobody could get it to look like that. And it's because they really tapped into the 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 real power of the visual storytelling that came from the source material. So I think if and when American films are looking to pull from these ideas that are presented in the anime, I would say that I'm excited for them if they are truly understanding what they are using from that. And if yes. they stay true to, to what's going on there, I think that can lead to some very compelling uh, movies. Okay. I think the same thing they said, uh, 300, there was a similarities and they were pulling like panel, panel to panel or panel to screen shots exactly. out of the 300 comic and it worked and we liked it. And it's one of those things that is funny to me because when, when I, when I first got started doing anything with film and I would watch, uh, either video game, uh, video game to film or, um, comic books specifically to film, I'd be like, they already have an entire storyline. All the relationships are already established. You've literally got a almost shot for shot of what we already liked and it worked. I don't know why <laughs> when I'm watching the movie, it's so different from the thing I read or watched before. Like I didn't, I didn't need that. I needed it to be, you know, when you go into film, there are some things you have to do story-wise sometimes to make something make sense, but that doesn't necessarily work with it. It works in a comic, but may not work like in a movie. But what was interesting is that how much they changed with the shot composition from those things to the movie. And it seems to be a bit unnecessary. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is there some step in there we're missing that I'm not understanding? Yeah, well, all the shots are chosen very specifically. So it's like, think of it as choosing notes in a song, right? It's like each note of the song is chosen very specifically. And if you play three or four of the notes differently, it's a different song. It just becomes a totally different thing. And so if you're making a film adaptation and you're pulling a scene from something that worked really well initially, if you take something that works well initially and then you change most of the notes within that song, it just totally changes it. It becomes very different. However, if you use the source material as inspiration and then you write your own song and that song is good, that's another route you can go and that can come off very well and you can say, oh, I see how it was inspired by. But if you split the difference and you don't know why the thing that you liked works well and you don't oh. know why you're trying to take a different perspective on the story, you end up with a very muddy song that just has notes all over the place and it just doesn't land. So I think people need to have a deeper understanding of what's working in their source material. And then ultimately, if they are choosing to change it, they need to know that they have to fill in those gaps. They're not going to fill themselves. You know? Got you. That makes perfectly good sense. It's, uh, I think a lot of, and I, and I, you know, I just assumed that there was a bit of ego maybe like, Hey, I don't want to copy too much. And that's understandable. I can understand if I got, you know, tasked with doing a project or something and I don't want to directly exactly duplicate the source material, but it does seem like we, we stray really hard from it. And it seems like some of the people who are making these projects, they're not really fans 
of the thing that worked. So if I'm not really a fan of the thing that worked, yeah, I'm definitely not going to be analyzing why it worked, right? I mean, I may not even really think that it worked. I'm just wanting the name recognition. So what you're saying is making making a ton of sense here. Um, is there anything else that you think we should we should know about? Any other examples you wanted to give us of some things we can do to tighten up these frames and compositions moving forward? Yeah, I guess um, I'll just make the note here since I know that we're close on time. I just would like to say that, uh, you know, the <laughs> the if I can just leave everybody with one thing, it's that if you spend time thinking about why you're choosing the shots that you choose, if you're thinking about why you're making the movie, if you really tap into yourself and understand why am I doing this, what do I want to say, and then you ask yourself, how will the way that I shoot it say that for me? That will put you on the right road, even if you don't understand uh, all of the different compositional techniques or vocabulary that we teach in our classes here. Even if you've never been on a film set before you're, and you're a first time director, if you are constantly checking in with why am I doing this? And then how is the way I'm gonna do it going to share that with people? That will help you uh, find the answers for yourself and what that might you know lead you to for instance if you've never directed a film and you say well i want to tell this story because i want people to understand i, I don't know something like the beauty of uh martial arts maybe that's why you want to make the movie you say i want people to understand how beautiful it is then if you know why you're doing it then you can say well how will the way that i approach this film show that to people and then that fills in all the blanks for you, you go well if it needs to be beautiful I should probably get somebody on my team that knows how to film things really beautifully. Or if you're going to cast your performers, you go, I want to cast martial artists that aren't necessarily like the most esteemed ones or the, the ones who can win fights the best, but I want to find the person who does it most gracefully. Or maybe that leads, to, you know, so it just, it lines up all your decisions and it starts cleaning up the infinite possibility and just honing in on, you know what you want to do so that's my that would be my broad advice to any filmmakers just check in with why you're doing it and then check in with how your how reflects that and awesome. you know there, the rest is good awesome anybody have any final questions okay well with that roman can you let everybody know where we can find you if we want to take some classes if we want to follow some things uh where can where can we locate you yeah, so uh, you can find us at filmreframe.com and follow us on Instagram at filmreframed. If you message me, if you direct message the Film Reframed account on Instagram, I'll take a look at it. I love to talk to new filmmakers. I love to help people with their projects. And ultimately, uh, if you have any larger questions or you want to talk about consultancy of some kind, you can email us at hello at filmreframed.com. Uh, we're very accessible when we start a new slate of classes. Uh, we do the announcement next week. So if you want to follow the Instagram so that you're in on the announcements, that's the way to do it. Awesome, Roman. Thank you so much for taking some time to educate us all on how to have more useful and impactful frames here at the Austin Action Fest 20 and Market 2021. All right, man. We'll, we'll be reaching out to chat with you soon about some different things. You take care, and we're going to get ready for the next one. Great. Thank you, guys. Yeah.